Hello and welcome to The Current Thing with me, Nick Dixon, and we have yet another excellent guest. He is running to be the mayoral candidate for Greater Manchester. It is, of course, Mr. Nick Buckley. Thanks for doing the show, Nick. You're welcome. Two Nicks on this show. Two Nicks. I know. Only one of us running for mayor, though, but you never know. <laughs> I am from the north. Half my family are from uh, the Manchester area in Lancashire, so maybe I'll give it a crack. I'll see how yours goes first. Yes. I suppose and, the... Um... And make sure they vote for me as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, your background's much more interesting than mine. Just a quick uh, flagging it to the viewer. I am in a brand new flat, just moved house. So sorry for the just blankness of my uh, background. Nick's is much more interesting. Um, Nick, I suppose the obvious question to start with is, why did you decide to run for mayor? Um, I think it's the same as, I've got the same feelings that many people have in the country, which is, I'm sick of the mess we're in. I'm sick of everything failing, services not working, concrete now crumbling, potholes, immigration, can't control our borders, crime is almost at epidemic levels in Greater Manchester, especially knife crime. And I decided I can't moan anymore now. But I'm sick of people moaning, especially men. We need to take some personal responsibility. We need to try to do something about it. And that doesn't mean we're going to be successful, but the least we can do is try. And in a democracy, the only way you can change the country is to be elected. The Manchester, Greater Manchester Mayor elections coming up on the 2nd of May. And I decided a few months ago, I'm going to give this a real go. So I've taken a year off work. I'm working on this full time. And I'm trying to raise my profile. I'm trying to sell my policies. And if I win, fantastic. And if I don't win, at least I can say, you know what? I try to improve my country. Yeah, because you talk in your manifesto about the managed decline you say the best we can expect from our political overlords is managed decline and they seem to be doing a good job of it. That is true. Everyone seems to have a general sense of misery and malaise in the country, pretty much on all sides, actually, just for different reasons. You know, if you're a Remainer, you might cite Brexit. And if you're on the right, you might cite immigration or something. But basically, everyone thinks the country is going to the dogs. I mean, do you think Britain is beyond repair or probably not? Presumably, that's why you're running. It's not beyond repair. And I challenge anybody who says it is. I challenge anybody who says this country's finished, this country's over. I'm sick of the English men who tell me I'm leaving. I'm going to go to Poland. I'm going to try to get to America. And it's like, how dare you? How dare you take all the benefits of this country? And just when we have a problem, now you're going to run away. There's a name for men like that. They're called cowards. So is this, can we fix this country? Of course we can. I mean, it's terrible at the moment, but we've been through worse. The 70s were worse than this. I remember the 70s. I remember the dead not being buried. I remember the piles of rubbish on street corners because of bid memo on strike. I remember sitting in a, a dark house because there was no electricity for day bomb. Every day there was an electricity strike and power going off. It was worse than this. This is bad because we're living through it. What we need is we need leaders. And we've not had leaders in this country now for 40 years. And we, ask, we have to ask why. And the reason why we've not had political leaders is because we've been part of the EU. And we didn't need leaders in this country. We needed middle managers. We needed middle managers in Parliament to implement directives from a foreign power. And that's what we've been doing. I'm hoping over the next 10 years now we've left the EU. And Brexit wasn't perfect, the deal we've got. But it's better than being in. And I'm hoping new leaders will start coming through the grassroots. Not the ones we've got in Parliament at the moment, None of them are good enough. They're all just different grades of middle managers. But we need we need a new Thatcher. We need someone like her or him to come along, to grab the country by the scruff of its neck and drag us out of this apathy, this malaise we're in at the moment. And that person will come. The problem is we've, we've not heard of that person yet, but that person is on its way. Yeah, it's quite funny. Keir Starmer just praised Thatcher the other day, but I don't think anyone believes Starmer is anything like Thatcher. Um, I was thinking about this, actually, when I looked at another part of your manifesto, which is sort of community over economy message. You say the Tories promise a bigger economy. Labour promises more public spending. Neither will make us happy. We need to feel integrated within our community, caring for our families and for our neighbours. We are social creatures, not accountants or consumers. And that was interesting to me because there's a kind of debate within the Tory party now between the kind of Thatcherites or sometimes it characterized a bit differently as the kind of Lib Dem side or the One Nation side. Then there's the NatCon side, which is the National Conservatives, who are more concerned about social conservatism and will accept a bit more interventionism from the state. It sounded to me like you were siding on that side. You were saying money's not everything, consumerism isn't everything. Although you've said we need a Thatcher, 
is your emphasis more on social conservatism than on the sort of economic libertarianism? It, it's all of it. I think it's it's all hand in glove. You can't do one without the other. We can't have a better country unless we fix many streams that are going wrong. So there is no silver bullet. Um, but the, the bit about the manifesto there, what I'm really talking about there is, if you look across the country, we're, we're richer now than we've ever been, even though you know we talk about child poverty and a, a crisis of living. You know, we're richer than we've ever been, and yet we seem to be more unhappy than we've ever been. So money isn't going to make us happy. Of course, we need to be a rich first world country and we need these benefits and we need these conveniences. Of course we do. But pursuing only that makes us hollow shells and that's what we're becoming. That's why no one can concentrate now on the internet and we have got to give messages now over less than 30 seconds because no one pays attention. So we need to go back to basics and that's a cliche in itself. And what I mean by that is... What's happened to the family in my lifetime? When I was growing up from a single parent household, I was the exception. None of my friends were single parent children. They all had fathers at home. Most of the kids we work, my charity works with now on the streets, I haven't got parents, I haven't got fathers at home. That's a huge problem. We denigrate the family all the time. We financially reward single mothers not to have men and fathers at home. We now have introduced new types of family to compete against a traditional family. And there's nothing wrong if you live in a non-traditional family because, you know, we're all sorts. But let's be honest with people. Let's say a traditional married family, mother and father, is the best way to raise your children. That's not my opinion. That's every report, every government and every university has ever produced in my lifetime says exactly the same thing. And yet we don't try to promote that. I'm not saying we denigrate other families, we persecute them. I'm just saying there's no truth anymore now. We're not all pushing in the same direction. We're all splitting up into tribes. And that will lead to tribal warfare. That's violence. Yeah, it's funny. Danny Kruger made the same statement at the uh, NatCon conference back in spring. And he was saying, you know, that the, the normative family is the building block of society or something along those lines. And everyone went crazy. And Matt Hancock said, I can't believe he's saying that. It's so terrible. It was a complete, completely obvious statement, yeah. which we all knew for generations until 10 minutes ago. And, and like you say, you're, you haven't been raised in that. It doesn't mean you can't advocate it. Like I don't have children, but I say we should probably have families, guys. You know, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Everyone takes it as a terrible insult now. Like, oh, that means he's a, a bigot. It's like, no, it's just you can't base society around really, uh, you know, a small percentage of people. It has to be based on something, on the majority, which has to be the nuclear family. So, yeah, I, mean, does, I totally and, agree. And it's not just a majority in this country. We're talking about the world majority. We're talking about the world majority historically. That's what we're talking about. Every culture, every people, every country and every continent have all come to the same conclusion up to 50 years ago, which was the nuclear family, mother and father in some sort of religious ceremony, having children and raising children with support of extended family and grandparents. That's been our history. And suddenly, the last 50 years, we think we know better than the whole whole memory of humankind over millennia. We're quite stupid creatures, really, if we think we know better. Yeah. Well, yes, there's this thing, especially on the left, of thinking they can change human nature, and just, it, it doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, maybe we'll look at some of your other key pledges, because one of them was promote the family as the foundation of our society. You also have scrap the money-grabbing scheme known as the clean air zone. I guess that's – I've not heard as much about that because I'm in London. We, we always hear about you, Les, but in Manchester, is it is it the clean air zone that's the big thing? It's it's our version of the, of the you, Les, basically. Yeah. Um, the cameras went up two years ago. Our current mayor, Andy Burnham, then lost his bottle because the people didn't want it, and he sent it for review. He's now decided a couple of weeks ago, I'm now against this, so I'm not going to implement it, even though we spent £200 million with the cat on the cameras and spent two years of his time trying to implement it. He's now seen the light. So it's not going to happen this year or next year, but I keep telling people, Andy Burnham only said, I'm not going to implement the cars while I'm mayor. We don't think he's going to be mayor much longer. We think he's going to jump to be an MP and get to London. So who comes after him can flick of a switch, can implement the cars on their day one. That's why I'm saying now, not only will I scrap the cars, I'm going to tear down the infrastructure. 
Because my initial thought was, let's keep all the cameras. It'd be great for crime detection. And then one night in bed, I woke up in a cold sweat going, if I leave all the cameras, the person who comes after me can flick the switch. And we've got 15 minute cities. We've got pay per mile for driving because I've left all the cameras. How stupid would I be if I let that happen? I love that you care enough to wake up in a cold sweat about the yeah. uh, Kaz cameras. I like that. But also, you'd be the ultimate Blade Runner. You'd be a guy tearing them all down. Because, of course, <laughs> are they doing that in Manchester, tearing them down? They're not. And I don't condone that. Because even though I'm against it, we cannot start picking the rules and laws we want to follow. Because that leads to anarchy. So, you know, the Blade Runners in London, we think are doing a great job chopping down the cameras. But what happens when another group of people decide they don't want to follow a certain law and they start implementing what they want? The way we change, we have to change the law in our country. And that's by being elected. It's about pressuring politicians. That's how we do it. So I don't condone, I don't, I don't condone the Blade Runners. I know why they're doing it, but they're wrong. Yeah, well, I suppose the North's always more sensible. I'm from Cumbria. Half my family's from the Manchester area. So, yeah, we, we're always a bit more sensible. But I can understand that. Um, yeah, but it's so unpopular, isn't it? It's funny that it's so unpopular. It takes a lot to rouse English people to tear down cameras. But in the past, it would be something like the poll tax. They might actually listen and go, we've gone too far. Now Sadiq Khan just calls everyone a Nazi. I mean, it's it's pretty appalling. Um, what about this one? Fix the police by turning them back into a police force. This is very interesting to me because the police are a bit of a conundrum. Whenever we cover them on GB News, we're sort of compelled to say, well, yeah, there are some wrong ones. You know, there's been rape cases. Obviously, Sarah Everard, the case being the most extreme example of where it was actual an actual murder and then then there's the sort of gallows humor of whatsapp message the messages that gets tied with that whereas i think that's probably banter in a lot of cases but then there's the sort of that element of the police but there is also the undeniable wokeness of the police and the undeniable two-tier policing we've seen it again with the palestine marches the the difference between being pro-palestine and being alleged far right you know person on the who's who's met tommy robinson 16 years ago or something you you see the kind of difference in in treatment and you see the woke policing so what what is your vision for how to fix the police yeah you a couple of points there that you raised the first one about the wrong ones in the police every institution has some wrong ones in it because we, we cannot filter out them all the time we try to do our best but some will always slip through What's happened with the police in the last 30, 40, 50 years is every decade we lower the bar for recruitment. We need more women. Oh, let's re- let's reduce the physical fitness of police officers so we can get more women. Well, that also means we get fat, lazy men as well. Let's, recru- let's reduce the recruitment so we can attract more Asian people and more black people. So let's not look at certain things. So we lower the bar and more bongans join the police. So we've damaged the police through recruitment. Um, and then the wokeness of the police, and this is where this is what annoys most people. We have police services now. No, I want a police force. I want a police force that hammers criminals. I want a police force that criminals are terrified of the police. I don't want me and you afraid of the police unless we're criminals. But I'm tired of this touchy-feely, pink and fluffy nonsense. And it's almost as if the police now treat criminals as if they're victims themselves. You're a victim of circumstance. It's because you were brought up in a single parent household. We feel sorry for you. You went to a poor school. We feel sorry for you. It's your culture and your parents. We feel sorry for you. And my answer is, I don't feel sorry for you, mate. I've worked with criminals for two decades. It is your fault. You had personal responsibility. And the more we pander to these criminals, the more we make excuses for them insults their neighbours who also have the same life, who live in the same streets as them, who may be poor, who may fail their education. They're not criminals. So stop looking at, stop trying to find excuses for our criminals now. The criminals because they're criminals. The cause of crime isn't poverty. The cause of crime are criminals. So let's hammer them. Um, and how do we do that in Greater Manchester Police? Well, we they want... We deprioritize all the woke nonsense. The mayor can't change the law. I can't invent new laws. But what I can do as the mayor, who's also the police crime commissioner, I can say to the chief constable, these certain crimes now are deprioritized. They're still illegal, by the way, but we're not going to pay much attention to them because we've got new priorities, such as looking on online, policing tweets inside of the streets, non-crime incidents, hurty words. All that will be deprioritized. 
it'll still be illegal, but we won't really be looking at it because I'll be looking at muggers, burglars, knife crime and rapists. That's what I want the police looking at. Then I'll be looking at the internal woke groups within Greater Manchester Police. We have something called the Black Officers Group, the LGBT Officers Group, the Muslim Officers Group. They all get disbanded day one. I'm not having identity politics in Greater Manchester Police. Those groups can still exist. Officers can still run those groups in their own time with no police resources, and they'll have no special bat phone to senior management when they come up with an idea, but they can still run those groups and chat about what they want to chat about. Absolutely fine. Freedom of speech. But they won't be representing police officers within Greater Manchester Police. So they all get disbanded day one. And then, go on, sorry. No, I was going to say, do you think you can really tackle woke, woke policing at a local level or is it just too deep in the in the system? No. It, the, the senior police have become politicised. All the lower rank police officers I speak to hate all this stuff. Some of them love it, but most of them hate it and are embarrassed about it. That's why the retention of police officers is quite hard at the moment because they're leaving because they're sick of it all. They're sick of the public hating them. Even law-abiding citizens now dislike the police. Criminals have always hated the police, but that means you're doing a good job. But now law-abiding people now think the police are a joke. Why would you do a job like that? So good officers are leaving. We need to retain those officers. And then we need to look at promotion within the police. And that will be one of my stages in my plan as well. To be promoted in the police, when you sit at that promotion board, you've got to come up with a brand new idea. And those ideas are normally based around being woke. How, how, are we going to, how are we going to engage the black community better? How are we going to have LGBT individuals support the police more? How, it's like, no, we're, we're not going to promote on those woke projects anymore now. We're going to look at things like dedication, physical fitness, knowledge of the law, respect, patriotism. That's what I'll be looking how we promote police officers within Greater Manchester Police. And within five to ten years, those officers will start moving up the ranks and the whole atmosphere and environment around senior police officers will start changing. It's going to take a decade um, to change the top senior police officers, um, but that's how we do it. We do it through promotion, start promoting the people we want to run Greater Manchester Police a decade from now. Makes sense. Oh, well, all right. Excellent. And yeah, the other thing, yeah, police retention, there, there was that thing recently where they had to, they were getting in trouble for using their weapons that they're allowed to have. They, it was Certain police are allowed to have firearms, and but then they were getting sued or they were getting in trouble for actually using them. And then they, they were handing them in and saying, well, we quit. They've not yeah. had any support. And like you say, the public turn against them. It's a tricky thing for a conservative because Suella Bradman just made a speech as we record this where she she uh, she mentioned her, the increase in police on the streets as part of a, a great thing she's done. So she was still proud of increasing the number of police. And yet there's this feeling the police are sort of against you if you're a conservative. Well, so we have a strange thing because we believe in police and order and police on the streets, the traditional idea of policing, but we don't agree with the new police. So it's a tricky one. So you're sort of saying the same. You support proper policing, basically, and good police, but not this new thing, which the police themselves don't even like. Yeah, I'm, I'm fully behind the police. I mean, I have to be. I spent, I spent two decades working with the police. At one point, I was based in police stations when I worked for the council as a manager. I've trained police officers. I've designed crime reduction projects that have won awards. So I'm, I'm pro-police. I just don't want the police force we have now, the way it's changing and what it's changing into. Um, and I think the general public is exactly the same. Without a decent professional police force, we're going to live in anarchy. Everybody I know wants to support the police, but is sick of the wokeness, sick of the double standards, sick of the two-tier policing. And all this is easy to change. And it'll be easy to change if you have a police crime commissioner, mayor, who who will protect the police. Because what the police do now, the senior police officers are scared to do anything because if it goes wrong, they're going to be thrown under the bus, just like those armed police officers were in the Met. So the politician goes, oh, I don't want any hassle on this. I don't want the bad publicity. I'll just sacrifice these officers. What I'll be doing is maybe saying, no, those officers that did the right thing, unless they've abused their power, obviously, but on the, on the whole, they've done the right thing and I stand by them because the police crime commissioner and the mayor should be there to protect the police politically so they can do what they need to be done. 
How can you police the streets where everything you do, am I going to get into trouble? Is someone going to take a photo of me? Is, is the mayor going to throw me under the bus? How do you do your job under those circumstances? You need, you need the ultimate boss who says, no, I support the police and, and I will take the flak. And I'll take the flak because I don't care. I'm not looking to be prime minister. I'm not looking to be elected again. I'm not looking to have a political career. I'm here to do the heavy lifting so we can have a better tomorrow. So I'm not worried about my career. All right. Great message. Um, not many politicians will say that. Um, as you say, you're not, you're not after a political career. What about this next one? You alluded briefly to free speech. And you say you'll create a free speech charter so everyone understands their rights. You can't change the law, you've said, but you'll just make it clear what people's rights are. Exactly. Most of the people I speak to, you know, average people on the streets, my mates in the pub, will say things like, oh, it's illegal to say that. It's like, it's not illegal to say that. We've created a whole atmosphere now where the average person is afraid to talk about sensitive subjects. And some of them actually think it's illegal. Have we got into such a state that English men and English women are afraid to speak in their own, their own country about what they want to speak about? We're turning into a nation of cowards, and I can't have that. So I'm going to work with someone like the Free Speech Union. I'll commission them to come up with a free speech charter based on existing law, because I can't create new laws. We'll get some top barristers involved, and we'll come up with a plan. Simple things, simple bullet points that people can understand so people know what they can say, what they can't say, what the law says, when you go too far, when you don't go too far. That will be on the mayor's website and people can download it and they know their rights then. So when a police officer stops you in the street and demands you stop preaching from the Bible, you can say, wait a minute, officer, let, let me just download this off the mayor's office, who's your boss, and let me show you what the mayor says I can say. And we can educate that police officer. If your boss says to you, you need to go to a white supremacy, negative, we hate white people training course, you can say, excuse me, no, I don't, because the mayor of Greater Manchester says these things on his website. And I want to give individuals the power and information for them to fight back. And if we lose free speech in this country, then I'll tell you, we won't be free people anymore. And I would rather hear hurty words and be called nasty names, which I am every day anyway, so who cares? I'd rather have that than lose the ability to speak because then how do we hold our politicians accountable? How do we call people out for being liars and being evil? They may not be liars, they may not be evil, but then how? But they have free speech then to correct me and say, you've misunderstood this, Nick. Free speech is vital if we want to be free. Yeah, and some would say we've already lost it, of course, in this country. And one issue is that does the law even matter? You're saying that, you know, we'll set out the law but a lot of these cases, the free speech union tackle, eventually they win, but you have to go through all kinds of pain and losing your job and financial pain, which they may cover for you if you're lucky. But it, the law isn't even the question. It, 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 you get put through, the process is the punishment. That's yeah. one issue. Then there's another issue. You, the police don't even know the law. So they'll arrest people and it will be overturned, but they still arrest them. Or we'll see posters like, I think it was being offensive is an offense and things like this, which it isn't. You know, they'll have all these non-crime hate incidents taken way too far when they shouldn't even exist, full stop. So it's almost like you're saying people need to know the law, but actually the law doesn't seem to really matter. It's, it's sort of more just what actually happens in reality, which is the law is often ignored or not known. Mm. I'm not saying this free speech charter will solve all our problems overnight, but it's the first step on empowering the public to fight for their rights. It's very hard to fight for freedom of speech when, when you don't know if you have it or not anymore. You've heard so many rumours, you've seen so many cases on TV and in the paper. You're not sure. Some of like, like I say, in the pub, some of the people I know actually think some things are illegal to say. And I'm going, they're not illegal. This will be a tool that people can use, A, to fight for their rights, B, to educate other people who may be infringing on other people's rights. Because a police officer who arrests somebody for hate speech might be thinking, well, that was illegal. But if he downloads the mayor's free speech charter, he'll be able to go, well, actually, it isn't illegal, is it? No, so I, so I won't arrest that person. This is just one, two, one extra tool to start empowering the people to fight back. It's not going to end the problem overnight, obviously. 
All right. Well, we may as well go through all your key pledges since I'm enjoying these. Let's do um, <laughs> let's do create a waste and incompetence watchdog to inform the public on how their taxes are squandered. Yeah. I worked for Manchester Council for 10 years. I could tell, well, I could tell you stories that you probably will believe about the incompetence, the waste. I won't get into those stories that I wrote about them. So they're on my sub stack if anyone wants to read them. Um, I'm tired of them. I mean, we're, pay, we're paying more tax now than we've ever done. And services are getting worse and worse. And we have to ask why. Part of the reason is identity politics. We're not recruiting the best people now to run our services. We're, we're box ticking. So we're getting incompetent people in projects. That's part of the problem. But then there's no accountability. And that's what I want. I want some accountability. So I won't be able to change some of these services Let's say it's the NHS in Greater Manchester wasting billions. But what I can do as mayor is shine a light on it and, and highlight a name of the person or the chair of the board or the CEO or the manager in that department. I can shine a light on them saying, this is the person who wasted £500 million on, on paper clips. And we've got now a thousand years worth of paper clips stored at the NHS. Or this is the manager, or this is the chair who introduced this new computer system that is incompatible with the old system, and now we can't use it. And these things happen all the time. I want senior managers and and chairs of boards of our public services to understand. I'm going to give them skin in this game. I'm going to highlight them, I'm going to shame them, I'm going to embarrass them when they're wasting our money. And it'll be it'll be unfortunate for the individuals I do it to, but the message that will send round the whole of Greater Manchester, as in, right, I better work a bit harder here, I better get some value for money here, because that crazy mayor we've got is going to name me, is going to shame me, so I better do a better job here. That's all we can do is start naming and shaming incompetence and hopefully that will lead to better results. Because the people at the top of our organisations are not all stupid. Some of them are very clever, but they're working within an incompetent system and they haven't got skin in the game. Here's a great example. I got promoted when I was in the council, moved up a level, moved into a town hall and my new manager, who I already knew, called me in his office for my introductory talk into his team. But sit down, Nick. Right, um, I know you, you know me. Do whatever you want. Don't cause me any work. And I left the office. And I literally, that was how quick my introduction to his team was. All he cared about was don't cause me any extra work. That's the environment of our public services. That, that's who we're promoting. That's the level of service we're getting. That's the sort of thing I'd be shaming. Yeah, I've been thinking about that myself. The lack of standards everywhere. It's everywhere you, It's everywhere in this country now, whether you're trying to do sort something on the phone. It's always like just we want no hassle. No, just anywhere you go, there's just low competence, low standards. It drives people like me mad. And I can tell you, you're yeah. the kind of person who turns up eight minutes early for an interview. So I can tell you're the kind of person who just drives you mad. But unfortunately, most people aren't like this. It seems like people are low in, uh, Jordan Peterson calls it conscientiousness. But it sounds like you're sort of you'll get in there and just kick some ass basically and make them accountable. I'm going to show I'm going to show the public everything that's going wrong. Not because I can fix it because I'm a, I'm a superhero. I'm a rocket scientist. I'm going to show everybody what's going on so they can change it by voting differently. That's how we change okay. all these things. Not by having you know an infiltrator, a ninja at the sides doing things. The voter needs to change it. But how do they change things when they don't know things are wrong or they don't know who to hold accountable? I want the voter to start doing it. Okay. Trump just said he's going to be a dictator, but only on day one. I like the idea of you coming into Greater Manchester and being a dictator on day one. It turns out you just meant close the border and drill for oil. Yeah. And he was just joking. But um, I'd like a dictator, Nick Buckley, in, in Greater Manchester. But um, I'm sure you won't be. I just want to look at these last couple, which are a little bit, local they're a little bit niche to maybe some of our audience but you say support bolton to hold a referendum on if they wish to be a part of greater manchester and give a referendum on, on whether people want want to keep the position of mayor at all i was really interested in that bolton one because i've always thought of bolton as lancashire being half my family being from lancashire i just thought it was but actually it joined greater manchester in 1974 which i was surprised actually like, when i was growing up i just always thought of it as lancashire and i was surprised to find it was actually greater manchester and i only mm. found out years later do the people of Bolton just want to be part of Lancashire again? It depends how old you are. 
So the older you are in Bolton, the more you miss being in Lancashire because Lancashire is a thousand years old. It's an ancient county. It has history. It has a memory. It has It's something to belong to. And in a time now where we feel like we don't belong to anything, in 1974, uh, the government decided they were going to create a new area called Greater Manchester. It didn't exist before 1974. And they pulled in 10 local councils, Manchester, Wigan, Bolton, and, and, and 10 altogether. Um, and nobody wanted it. They weren't asked. They were forced into it. And a lot of people have resented it ever since. Now, many people in Bolton want to rejoin Lancashire and leave Greater Manchester. I don't know if that's going to be a good idea or a bad idea. All I know is if enough, if enough people in Bolton want to have a say on this, because we were never given a say in 1974, the least we should do as Democrats is to say you should have a say and we'll hold a referendum. And if you all vote to leave, well, then you leave Greater Manchester and we'll have to deal with the consequences afterwards. And it may be the wrong decision. But I'd rather the people made the wrong decision than constantly having government making the wrong decisions for you, because that's called accountability. That's you taking on personal responsibility. So again, I don't know if that's going to be a good decision for Bolton, but I trust the people of Bolton to make the best decision for them. And there's a group in Bolton, a small political party called Bolton for Change, and they're running this campaign, gaining signatures, um, and hopefully if they get enough signatures, we may be able to trigger a referendum and I will support that if I'm mayor. And then the other point you talked about was the mayor about the Greater Manchester mayor. Very similar story again, because our politics and our politicians don't like democracy. They never like asking the people, especially after Brexit, they don't want to ask the people ever again about anything. So the mayor of Greater Manchester 10 years ago was forced upon us in Greater Manchester. No one asked us. No one did a consultation. George Osborne, the minister at the time, uh, forced Greater Manchester to accept a mayor and we'll give you a load of money. That's what he did. Nobody wanted a mayor in Greater Manchester. The last thing we wanted was a whole new layer of bureaucracy, a whole new layer of politics that we're going to have to pay for. And if you live in Greater Manchester, look on your council tax bill. There's a whole new line there now saying mayor's office. We weren't paying that 10 years ago but now we're paying for new politicians. So I'm going to offer the people of Greater Manchester a say to tick that box of democracy that we've not ticked yet. I'm going to say, do you want a mayor of Greater Manchester? If you do, great. If you don't, we'll scrap it because we can't have these layers imposed upon us when the public never wanted it in the first place. And I'll be one of the only politicians to say, and I'll do myself out of a job because again, I don't necessarily want the job. I don't want to crave in politics. I want to fix my country. And if we can show our country that people power and the voice of the people leads to change, and in Greater Manchester, it might lead to getting rid of the mayor. Well, fantastic. That just means we've shown people their voice matters. And we might have put a little bit more respect back into British politics, because that's what we're lacking, respect in British politics. All right. Excellent. And the the uh, Lancashire point means quite a lot to me. Half my family being from Lancashire, my mum being from uh, Bury, and all my family on that side going back to the cotton mills. And so I hope they do get that if that's what they want. And Cumbria is the same. So I'm from Cumbria. That was created in 1974 from Cumberland and uh, Westmoreland. And what was going on in 1974? I think it was Harold Wilson, wasn't it? Yep. it was probably Labour. It's a very Labour thing to do to start chopping up the country differently from how we historically want to be. It, w it was a Tory. So it was, was it? Conservative government did it. And I'm not sure if this is true or not, but what I've been told by people who are fighting for this was it was it was really about joining the EU. We just joined the EU. And the EU likes countries split up into administration areas for when they deal out grants and they're dealing with areas. So they wanted new administration areas across the UK. And that's why we created them like that. That's what I've been told may okay. or may not be true. I assumed it was going to be Labour. That That's a, a classic mistake because, of course, our Tories are uh, basically lefties anyway and, yeah. and, um, and bureaucrats. I mean, that's actually a, a good point to move on to sort of wider topics. Because we've covered all your key pledges. I mean, where do you see it going, actually, with the future of the, the Tory party? I mean, I've got this prediction because I like to make bold predictions and I want to just get the tweet so that people know that I predicted it, that Farage will lead 
here's what I'm saying. Tories get smashed with Sunak. Starmer ruins the country for five years. Farage becomes leader and becomes prime minister with the Tories in 2029. This is my bold prediction. But where do you see it going? And do you see Farage coming into Tories or do you see a third party like Reform making an impact? What's your opinion? The Tories have to be wiped out next year. Have to be. Um, And I say that for their own good. The Tories and Labour, whoever's in 10 Downing Street, are taking us to the same destination, which is destruction. The Tories are taking decades to get us there. Labour will do it a lot shorter. So we're heading in the same direction, to the same destination. So we need to destroy the Tories, the next general election. So like you, they spend five years in opposition, sorting themselves out, getting rid of all the wets. Half the Tory MPs at the moment wouldn't have been Tory MPs 20, 30 years ago. They'd have been Blairites, they'd have been Lib Dems, but they've watered down what it is to be a Tory so much that anyone can join the Tories now, um, and that's what's killed them. It was it started many years ago, but you know Cameron becoming Prime Minister, becoming the leader of the Tories, which was the final nail in their coffin. He, he walkedified the party. So hopefully they'll spend five years in opposition, They'll steal lots of my policies. They're happy to have them because it's what the people want. And then Labour will destroy it even more. And maybe then in five years' time, 2029, like you said, they may have another chance of getting back into power. Will Farage come? Will Farage join? Will they let Farage join? And if he joined, would he be leader? He, he's potentially the type of leader they need. But political parties are, are very... So what I'm looking for very clicky. I'm not sure that I'm not sure they'd let him join. I'm not sure they'd want him in. They'd want him in. I really don't know. But I'm hoping by that time we'll have new Tories coming through, new leaders coming through, who are proper leaders, and one of them will capture the nation's attention, and someone like that will come through and lead the Tory party to success. But time will tell. Um, will a third party break through? We have these conversations every 10 years. It never happens. But what small parties can do is influence the big parties. So if a small party has a really popular policy, the big parties will steal it. Uh, UKIP forced the Tories into a referendum they never wanted. So these small parties can have a say and are really, really important to change the direction of the big parties. But I'm... I realise I'm quite poor at making predictions. Uh, I really am quite poor. Uh, well, it doesn't really go well for anyone, but um, I just make it just in case it's right. I've got the tweet. But, um, is, I mean, is Britain behind Europe is another question I was going to ask you, because you, you allude to the fact there that all a third party can do in this country is influence the main two parties. And, of course, that's because of first past the post. In Europe, they have proportional representation. It's quite different. Mm-hmm. And what we're seeing now is people like Hurt Wilders in the Netherlands, we're seeing some pretty, what would you call him, pretty populist right people coming through. Uh, he's got some very tough stances. I mean, his stuff on Islam has been extremely tough. He's toned it down a little bit. Um, and what we have is arguably, as I was saying in an earlier podcast with Ed Dutton, it's the the polarization of the left and right is probably what's happening in Europe and no center anymore. And we seem to be a bit behind. And I've been asking people why they think this is. Proportional representation is an obvious one. Mm-hmm. We're just a bit different in general. We, we're a bit less hardcore in this country about a lot of things. We don't have borders. We're an island. We're a bit more moderate than Europe in many ways. We don't have the history of fascism and communism. We have a history of fighting fascism. So we don't tend to be comfortable with the sort of anything that sounds far right or anything. What do you think is going to happen? Are we going to move more like Europe? Are we going to be different because of our system? Any thoughts? We're going to be different. You're quite right. We've never had the hard left or the hard right in this country because we're sensible people and we have a political system that works over the long term. I'm not really for proportional representation at the moment. I can't see the benefits. I think all that does is it gives power to the fringe elements. It gives more power to those fringe elements who can sway elections. We need to govern countries for the long term, not the short term. Otherwise, we're swinging from far left to far right to far left to far right. And we need to be planning for the future. That doesn't mean our system is perfect. There is no perfect political system out there. I've just got a little bit of British pride in our system when I look across the water to Europe 
thinking, do I want any of their systems based on their history? Do I want any of their systems? And the answer is no. So I'm quite happy sticking with our system at the moment. doesn't mean it doesn't need tweaks. It doesn't mean we don't need better leaders. But I think if we have better leaders, our system will work a lot better. Yeah, we definitely need better leaders. I mean, Dominic Cummings was talking about our leaders are sort of trapped in the Cold War to 2001 era. He was talking about Cold War to 9-11. He said they all want to live in that era when things were just better and more free. And they were, but we're not in that era anymore. And we just don't have the leaders we need for it. And we also have the civil service making everything near, near impossible. And if you listen to someone like Cummings, who's been on the inside, he says even a leader of a department can only sack three people. And that's all they can do. And they can't really do anything about the blob. And the prime minister has power to sack them. But it's unfeasible that a prime minister will be able to sack everyone in all these departments practically. So he just says it's just a, a bureaucratic nightmare system. And the young people who actually have talent tend to leave because they don't get promoted and they don't see a meritocracy. And so my question here is, can we actually solve any of these big problems? Immigration being the, the massive one. We're constantly debating this Rwanda plan at the time of recording, incredibly boring. And that's only dealing with the small boats, mm. which is not the main problem, which is legal immigration being so insanely high, 745,000 net. And that, the Tories are now saying they're going to get it down by 300,000. Well, it'll still be massive. Can we solve any of these problems, especially immigration? You can solve immigration overnight if we had a leader with balls. It really is that simple. You can stop the boat within a fortnight. You can stop heavily reduced legal migration over a year or two and then, then get it down to practically zero because that's what the public wants. All this can be done. We haven't got politicians who are, who are willing to sacrifice their careers to try to achieve it. The first thing we need to do is write a letter to the European Court of Human Rights saying, hello, we've left. That's it. And then we've left. And then we can do what we want. And it really is that simple. Some of the problems we've got are really complicated. Immigration isn't complicated at all. We pull out of the Convention of Refugees, the 1954 United Nations Convention of Refugees, but pull out of that because that's not fit for purpose anymore now. And we say to, we say to the world, we're going to do what we want to do. And we don't need to be members of the European Court of Human Rights because we've never had issues with human rights in the first place in this country. We helped develop that court to stop mainland Europeans killing each other and, and us going back over there to sort them all out. That's why we created that court. We didn't do it because we've got a problem. We've never had a problem. We're the country the, world, the rest of the world needs to look up to and do look up to saying that's the country we need to copy and we need a leader to take us back to those great heights where we're the country people want to emulate I absolutely agree on that. And we we are the pioneers of civil liberties. And But do you, well, two questions then. I'll ask firstly, but do you believe that immigration is necessary though for, some people say it's necessary for our GDP or they think it's necessary for our birth rate issue. Is there any positives to it? There's always positives to, to everything. Um, are those small positives worth the negative? Absolutely not. So first of all, we've got a Ponzi scheme in this country. We say we haven't got enough workers to do the jobs. We haven't got enough carers to look after our old people. There's two issues there. Why are we letting the state look after our old people? Families need to be looking after their elderly people. I'm tired of us throwing out old people onto the trash heap and letting strangers look after them. That's what families need to do. So that's something where we're letting our families down. But the more people we allow to come into the country... In 50 years from now, we need even more people to look after them. It's a Ponzi scheme. This all collapses at some point. And at the same time, we're being told we need more workers and more immigrants. We're then being told by another group of people, AI is coming. There's going to be no jobs soon. So why are we letting millions and millions into the country? There's no jobs soon. What we need to do over a two-year period is we dramatically reduce how many people are coming in working. And we tell businesses what we're doing and we need to stick to this plan because businesses then need to go, right, I'm not going to get any more Eastern Europeans now to pick my strawberries. I need to get a bank loan and invest a quarter of a million pounds in strawberry picking machines. There's technology now for everything we want to do. Google later, strawberry picking machine. These robots that go onto the fields, it only picks ripe strawberries because it looks at the colour and analyses the colour of the berry and and, and it does that. 
and it picks them. We've got machines and technology for everything almost. So let's get people investing in that and give them a couple of years to do it. And we keep knocking down how many people are coming over. And then we need to look at British citizens who are sat on the dole. We've made it far too comfortable. So I can go down a, a route now of saying, punish those people. Or the, let's forget about punishing them. Let's talk about the environment and the messages society sends to people that makes them think it's okay to sit on benefits all their lives and let other people work and pay for them. That's the problem. So let's not punish people who have made a decision that was legal in this country, but let's start changing how we look at unemployment. The first thing I would do for all our benefit systems, apart from pensions, because pensions you pay into and it's a benefit you've paid into, but everything else, I would change it. I wouldn't call the welfare state anymore. Now I wouldn't call it benefits. I would call it state charity. And you, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here to claim state charity today. Thank you. Oh, you have an employment state charity. Yes, I am. Let's start calling it what it is, which is charity. And then let's start training up some of these individuals and forcing some of these individuals to start doing these jobs that we're having to get immigrants to do. That will drive up the prices of what it costs to employ a care worker. Stacking shelves in Tesco's, it'll, it'll, they won't be on minimum wage anymore. They'll be on 15, 20 pound an hour. Our prices in shops will go up. I'm fine with that because that's helping my fellow citizens. I'd rather them be working and have a successful, productive life than dumping them on benefits and letting them lead unfunctioning, tired, miserable lives. So it's about investing in our own people. Yeah, I agree. And I'm, I've been on benefits as a as a tr- troubled youth. It's tough. It's no, it's no fun. And I, I personally only believe in incentivizing work that's that's what what i believe i I believe a lot of people want to work on benefits some don't of course but mainly just incentivize work and make it pay which no one's really managed to do there was a scheme where you got for one year you kept your benefits and you kept your wage that was scrapped no one else managed to radically incentivize work. of course a human is not going to work if they're if they're struggling and they're at the bottom and they look at it logically and go if i work i'm going to lose money yeah. make my life more unstable and risky and stressful <clears throat> who's going to do that eventually i did do that because you, you take but it takes a lot of character and it takes you have to personally sort of have a talk with yourself but not everyone's capable of doing that so how do we like radically incentivize work we we stop annual increases in benefits so we don't cut them because how can people live when we've just suddenly cut them because they're used to what they've got we stop increasing them in line with inflation. So over time, they become less and less attractive. We then start driving up wages by reducing immigration. And then we start trying to introduce, for many of our issues, societal shame, where people are ashamed to be claiming benefits, are ashamed to be unemployed because you look down upon in society. And and society needs to take some responsibility for this. When I was a kid growing up on a tough council estate, I said, all all my friends, apart from one, had a dad at home and they all worked. And we lived on a really poor, tough council estate and in nearly every household, adults were working. But that culture now is gone. And the culture is sign on. Our education is to blame. We we don't teach our kids now any work ethics, um, how to get a job. No, I'm working with kids who don't even know how to get a job who will answer their phone in the middle of an interview that I've had employing people. Just a minute, mate, let me get this. I'm interviewing you for a job (laughs) or turning up stinking of cannabis. So our young, a lot, not all, but there's a percentage of our young people who are almost unemployable after 11 years of state education. Our state education fails one in five young people in England and Wales. It's 18%. We fail them. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell me about it. I've been to a comprehensive school. They are awful, and that is terrible. People answering their phone in an interview, but it's not surprising, is it? And on the other stuff, AI. You're right. That's a good point. AI is going to replace a lot of these jobs, and the yeah, and the very good point on the short termism of, of immigration. We're going to hopefully have Paul Morland, who's an expert in birth rates, come on and talk about all that. Uh, although there is an irony that a lot of immigrants do care for their elderly more than mm. more than you know traditionally British people do. So that that's interesting, but. Um, because we haven't got that much time, I want to get on to a totally, totally different topic. You've got a book on feminism coming out, and I believe it's got quite a subtle title. 
book's already out. I think it came out three weeks oh. ago. Oh, sorry. It's yeah. called Feminism, Myths, Lies, and Ungratefulness. <laughs> I just love that. That's <laughs> Uh, it's just no, just no messing about. Yeah, I like I like your pro shame idea, by the way, as well. That we need more shame, but I like both these ideas. And uh, what, so, what's the book about, Nick? I mean, sounds a ridiculous question. Yeah. <laughs> well, to begin with, the first three books I published on on courage, and then one on begging. I got publishers to do that. This book, I couldn't get a publisher to touch it. I had right. I had to self publish, and and it was the title. So I self published on Amazon, which I'm going to do from now on. It was easy, and I can sell the books at half the price than what a publisher was selling them for. So my books are available on Amazon, on paperback and Kindle. Um, So what's the book about? The book really is exploring ground zero of the wokeness we've got at the moment, and the ground zero is feminism from nearly 200 years ago when it started. And it came out of the slavery movement, the anti-slavery movement, and so I talk about the history of it. I talk about, I explored some of the myths and the lies, like the gender wage gap, about men being you know, violent. Did you know that women can com- commit more domestic violence than men? I did, but only because I follow Pearl's, yes. Pearl Davis's Twitter account. Yeah. <laughs> so I list the studies. I talk about the studies. So this isn't my opinion. Everything I say, I back up with evidence. I then you know talk about... Um, how it's damaging women, um, and I end the book by giving examples that men are not the enemy of women. So this book's not about attacking women. It's about attacking an ideology called feminism. But the last chapter just shows what men do for women, the inventions. Um, have you heard of an Indian guy called Padman? Yeah, the uh, yeah. the tampon. Tampon King of India. I talk about him. I talk about the men who invented the the mammogram machine, the men who invented all these things that improved women's lives. Not everyone's lives, specifically women's lives. And I'm tired of feminists always accusing men of being evil and being persecutors. Men risk their lives every day. Who do you think shouts women and children first in emergencies? It's not women. Men shout that. And men will assault other men who do not abide by that. Men are always protecting women and children because that's our innate role. And we need to call out feminism more. And women need to call out more because we've had feminism policies now all my lifetime, for like 60, 70 years now in the UK, in the West. And every year we get more and more feminist policies. And guess what? Every decade women report more and more unhappiness. Men's happiness has stayed the same in the last 70 years. Women's unhappiness is increasing every decade. More feminist policies, more unhappy women. Yeah, it does seem that way. And it is changing a little bit to where the kind of hatred of men is turning around a little bit or it's being forced to be reckoned with because people like Andrew Tate, of course, have started to have a massive influence because, and then then we see all these articles, oh, the young boys need to stop listening to Tate. He's turning them hateful and evil. It's like, is he, or is he responding to the hatred against them for, for decades? I mean, are you seeing that you've worked with a lot of young people? How do you find that uh, young men feel about these things? Men love women. Young boys, young men love women and will protect women. I've been on street corners where you know teenagers have almost got into violence over what another young teenager either said to a girl in the group or pushed her. Um, and you risk violence putting your hand on a girl because that's a male trait. Andrew Tate, I've not heard much of Andrew Tate, so you know somebody may come up with something I disagree with that he said. That that's a given. But what I've heard, I don't disagree with anything he said. What's wrong with Andrew Tate? It's the same thing that's wrong with Tommy Robinson. It's not what they say. What people don't like is the messenger. It's not what they say, because what they say is usually quite mainstream and, you know, sometimes a bit provoking and could be saying a slightly better way. But It's not the message. They just don't like the individuals, so therefore attack the individual. But men need to start being men, and that's what I've been telling young men now, late teenagers for two decades. Stop being a pussy. Women don't want pussies. That doesn't mean they want you to be a thug and beating people up. But don't be an inferior version of a woman because 
Nobody wants the inferior version of anything. So when a woman tells you she wants you to open up and cry and be emotional, she's an idiot. She doesn't know what she wants. Because the second you cry in front of her, the second she'll lose all respect for you. And the second I'll lose respect for you as well. Because men don't cry. And I'm tired of men talking about suicide, talking about we need to open up more and we need to be more like, it's like, no, 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 no. That's what's killing men is being more like women. You know, men will stop committing suicide when there's more roles in society for them, when they're not being hounded all the time, when they're not being persecuted. That's when men will stop committing suicide, not when they start acting more like women and opening up and doing group hugs and singing Kumbaya. If I had to do that, I'd want to kill myself. Well, you, you've got the next book title, Stop Being a Pussy, <laughs> by Nick Butley. That's so funny. But um, no, I totally agree. A great point you made about men being an inferior version of women and, and crying. So a lot of uh, that stuff is, I do believe it's kind of a test from women. They'll say they want certain things, but you're actually not supposed to really go along with them. You're actually supposed to resist them and prove you're actually more of a man. You, you actually, you know, we're not supposed to buy into this thing. Yeah, it doesn't help men to cry more and be like women it helps us to lean into masculinity be, and and do be more like men but mm. um the other thing that springs to mind when you say that inferior version of a, a woman is the trans thing i wonder if you cover that in the book because there's a claim from the turf side and obviously i agree with the turf side on most points but when they what they tend to do which is a radical feminist side but what they tend to do is or so-called what they do is blame men a lot they say oh it's the men trying to get into changing rooms and blah blah and they mean the trans thing and i think it's not really men it's a tiny percentage of men and I believe it comes from feminism. Once you say a woman is just like a man and women can be in the army, women can do everything men can, mm. well, why can't women be men and vice versa ultimately? To me, that's where it leads. So to me, they're barking up the wrong tree when they say, oh, look at this men again. To me, it's like, no, it's not men. It's a few weirdos on the far left. Or, and it's actually come from feminism. Do you agree with that? There's a whole chapter in the book. So oh, um, really? uh, there's a chapter of the book called something like A Legitimate Concern. So I actually talk about the trans issue because it's the only legitimate concern that some feminists have now with the radical feminists. So there's a civil war within feminism at the moment. You have progressive feminists who are pro-trans and you have radical feminists who are anti-trans using their spaces. But radical feminists, it's a bit like choosing between Hitler and Stalin who you want as your friend. Do you know what? You want neither. Radical feminists may be on the right side around the trans issue, but radical feminists hate men. The reason why they don't like trans women is not because they're trans women, it's because they're really men. That's why they hate them. So this issue has come out of feminism. Feminism spent years, as you just said, telling, telling men, be more like women, masculinity is toxic, be more like women, you know, the moisturize, pedicure, or, you know, be gay, you're one of the girls. And then some men realized, it's tough being a man. There's no benefits of being a man. I have all the downsides with none of the positivity anymore now. So if I think I'm a good man, but all men are evil, I must be a woman. So I'm going to be a woman. And then there's loads of feminists out there go, yay, you're the woman now. Come into our spaces. Men did not invade women's spaces. Trans women did not invade women-only spaces. Trans women were invited in by progressive feminists. Yeah. That's the truth. Yeah, I tend to agree. I tend to agree. And yeah, mm. but I suppose the fair term is gender critical feminists rather than radical feminists, but yes. that's, that's what they use. But yeah. but they, yeah, I totally agree with that. And they do seem to have this hatred of men. So yeah, we agree on this topic. We're sort of strange allies, but really, yeah, the, the way they always just say it's men, I, I always think it's barking up the wrong tree. And they say it's misogyny. I just don't believe it's the root is misogyny. I just believe the root is leftism and feminism getting out of control and, and yeah. let me say something controversial no such thing okay. as misogyny doesn't exist never been proven talk about it in the book i highlight so many social scientist studies and reports that's actively looking for misogyny in men and can't find any at all and all their results come back basically saying men prioritize women over other men they then, did, they then did studies on women looking at misandry. They can find misandry in women because women will put other women above men. So misogyny does not exist, which is a hatred of women. No man hates all women. Some men hate particular women, 
because we hate that person. But no man ever hates all women. Doesn't exist. And when we use the word misogynist now, what we mean is sexist. But we've stopped using the word sexist. And do you know why? Because men started using it against women. That's sexist to a woman. So feminists then went, oh, they, they've appropriated our magic word now. You know, sexist. We need another word. Ah, let's reappropriate misogyny. Let's change the meaning of misogyny. And let's see if men can use that against us. And that's so misogyny now just means sexist. So what's the difference if a man's being sexist or he's being misogynist? Well, the technical definition is sexist is treating someone differently because of their sex. We do it all the time. There's good sexism and there's bad sexism. Misogyny means a hatred of all women. And a man's never existed who hates all women. All right, love it. Misogyny doesn't exist. Yeah, doesn't exist. Very based. Um, All right, well, since we've come up to an hour, Nick, and we've covered loads of interesting topics, I'll just ask one last question I sometimes like to end with, which is how do we win the culture war? And this assumes, of course, one, that it is a war, and two, we're on the same side, but I I think those two are probably true. So how do we win this thing? We win by English men and women in this country saying no more and stop being cowardly. The reason why the far left have taken over our industries, not industries, institutions, because we let them, because we had it so good that we didn't want to cause a fuss and we couldn't see the problem. And now we've just become cowardly. There's nothing I can do. I hear English men say it all the time, nothing we can do. This country's over. No point fighting. And I say, no, 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 no. What you actually mean is you're too cowardly to try. That's what you mean. If everybody in this country did their little bit, a tiny, tiny bit, and you add all that up, politicians would take note and we'd get the leaders we need. And that amount of change would be like a tsunami crashing on the country because all those little bits all add up. And cowardice, that's the problem. That's the real epidemic we've been suffering in my lifetime, an epidemic of cowardice. All right. Very strong. I mean, I do know some good people who've left the country and I do know mm. some people say that's the take they have. You should leave. And Peter Hitchens famously said it a while ago. But I, I'm like you. I have to say I'm, I'm more a stay in England, fight to the death, whatever Churchill said, till we're choking on our own blood or whatever he said. I'm more, I'm more in that camp. Yeah. All right. Well, you and me will be staying here fighting, Nick, and trying <laughs> to win this thing. Um, brilliant stuff. Where can people find you then? I'm all over social media. Just... Um... Find me at, at Nick Buckley MBE. Um, I'm on everything, especially on YouTube, especially on Twitter. It's great to see you back because I think last time we spoke on your podcast, you were banned from Twitter. I got banned. Now X, yeah. and you're back. I, well, I got banned. Did Musk let you back on? He did. He did. I got. I was banned for seven months for criticizing a Ukrainian refugee. Um, I got banned it. for seven months, <laughs> and then suddenly, when he took over, I came back. Amazing. Well, yeah, I really hope X works out and because yeah. people like you are back on. And, and of course, and so you're on X at Nick Buckley MBE, because of course you do have an MBE, yeah. and you're going for mayor. So your website is nickbuckley4mayor.co.uk. Yes. I'm a ma- ma- right. manifesto on the website. Check it out. Lots of information on there, especially if you're living great in Manchester. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks so much for doing the show, Nick. You're fantastic. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Cheers. All right, that was Nick Buckley. Always great value. Shame is good. Don't be a pussy. And I loved his messages for Greater Manchester as well. I would definitely vote for him if I was in the area. We'll put all his information in the show notes if you want to support him. And if you want to support me, go to buymeacoffee.com slash Nick Dixon. You can buy me a digital coffee. It's basically just a donation. You can leave a comment. I reply to all of them. Buymeacoffee.com slash Nick Dixon. Or you can go to my substack, nickdixon.substack.com and get all my articles for five quid a month. And hopefully, if you give me enough donations, I'll be able to get some sort of background on this podcast because I'm in my new flat with nothing, guys. So we need some sort of uh, background to make this look a bit better. So it's buymeacoffee.com slash Nick Dixon or nickdixon.substack.com. And we'll see you again next week.